Hello, sports history fans. This is Joe Ziemba. I'm the host of When Football Was Football here on the Sports History Network. And before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's new sponsor. We at the Sports History Network have partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States where you can get great deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. Rochester Sports Autographs even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site. So, there's really something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day already, or Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about a gift for yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups. And they choose to pass the savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to the following. ShopRSA.com forward slash SHN. That's ShopRSA.com forward slash SHN to get your piece of sports history today. Hi, baseball fans, and welcome back to the ballpark. This is episode three of the Pastime Timeline podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilkinson, and today we're going to look at the 1902 Major League Baseball season. The 1902 season saw the American League fend off challenges from within and without in its second season, while the National League fielded perhaps the best single-season team you've never heard of. However, this was not a banner year for the senior circuit. Let's start with the AL's internal challenge, the fallout from which set up the game to thrive in the nation's biggest city. But we'll get back to that. It was all brought about by one of the most dynamic figures in the history of their national pastime, John Joseph McGraw. McGraw was a product of his upbringing. A hard childhood under a cruel father fueled McGraw's unquenchable desire to win at all costs as a player and as a manager. He served as a precursor to later star players such as Ty Cobb, Enos Slaughter, and Pete Rose. From the beginning, American League President Van Johnson and McGraw seemed an unlikely fit, with McGraw's baseball and life ethic directly contradicting with Johnson's vision for the AL. Johnson built his league's reputation on clean and gentlemanly play to distinguish itself from the rough-and-tumble National League. And who was one of the rowdiest players in the senior circuit? That would be McGraw, whose feisty and combative leadership made the Baltimore NL club a mini-dynasty in the 1890s. While bringing McGraw in to play for and manage Baltimore appeared to be good PR for the brand new league, it was destined to fail. Despite a relatively uneventful first season, I've seen sources where there was a suspension involved, McGraw and Johnson had a cold tension relating to behavior with umpires. In 1902, McGraw could only last until late April. In a game against Boston, he was hit by a pitch in five consecutive at-bats, but the home plate umpire believed McGraw made no attempt to avoid the pitches and refused to award him first base. McGraw protested by sitting on the plate. He was then ejected from the game, and a riot nearly broke out in response to the umpire's actions. Johnson knew he must squash this activity before it proliferated. He suspended McGraw for five days, and that likely proved to be the last straw for McGraw, who began plotting his escape and a plan of retaliation against the AL. In late June, McGraw signed to manage the New York NL franchise, where he'd spend the next 30 years as one of the best managers of all time. He escaped his Baltimore contract in early July and took over last place New York about a week later. And as part owner of Baltimore, he also helped organize the sale of the franchise to a group of NL owners who released enough Baltimore players to leave them without an adequate roster. The other seven teams of the AL needed to provide them players just to complete the campaign. 
Johnson vowed to get back at McGraw, and he did just that by moving the Baltimore franchise to New York for the 1903 season. It would take a couple decades of ups and downs, but that franchise in New York would become the most successful sports organization in American history. It would also be a continual thorn in McGraw's side in the battle for the fans of the nation's biggest city. Of course, no great story can be passed down without conspiracy theories. Many thought McGraw caught wind of Johnson's plan to leave him out of a New York move and acted preemptively. Others felt the battle was exaggerated for effect, with each man's eyes set on New York City and a backroom deal already in effect. The two strong-willed men truly disliked each other, and regardless of the exact truth of the proceedings, Johnson almost certainly wanted McGraw out of his league. But moving into New York was the primary focus. Once McGraw made his move, the door was open for Johnson to make his. The challenge to the Yale from without came from the political realm because we all love our sports and politics mixed, right? A Pennsylvania court ruled that Philadelphia AL Triple Crown winner Napoleon Lajouet and two teammates could no longer play in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania unless it's for their former NL club. Johnson desperately wanted to keep his best player from 1901 in the AL, so he and Philadelphia's Connie Mack orchestrated a transfer of Lajouet from Philadelphia to Cleveland. The loan stipulation was that he couldn't play in Philadelphia. One of his teammates also went to Cleveland, while the other returned to the NL. So Cleveland has the Pennsylvania court system to thank for receiving its first star player in franchise history, so much so it would play under the nickname Naps for the entirety of Lajouet's time there in his honor. Ironically, losing Lajouet not only didn't hurt Philadelphia, but Connie Mack's club went on to win its first of many AL pennants following a fourth-place finish in 01. Mack penciled six 300 hitters into his lineup. Third baseman Lave Cross led the club in average at 339 and RBI with 106. League home run champion Sox Seabull drove in 97 more runs. But perhaps the biggest key was purchasing the contract of pitcher Rube Waddell. The lefty won 24 games from May on and paced the American League in strikeouts. Ed Plank also turned in a 20-win season. So for all the drama on and off the field in 1902, the three franchises most directly affected and the American League as a whole were actually strengthened as a result. Despite its best efforts, the National League failed to brush off Johnson's band like it had the American Association and the Players League in the late 19th century. The established NL was outdrawn at the gate significantly in the four seasons where each league had a team, and overall the AL drew 30% more fans than the NL in 1902. In anticipation of this very possibility, in December 1901, half the NL owners desperately attempted to form a syndicate, a trust, that would allow the stakeholding owners to manipulate rosters to affect the pennant race and attendance. But with help from baseball magnate Albert Goodwill Spaulding, the other owners shut down this plan which would have benefited only certain clubs. The status quo would not, could not hold. The NL had to call for a ceasefire. Meanwhile, the National League on the field brought absolutely zero drama. 1902 was the final year in which the NL considered itself the only legitimate major league. Its final season before officially sharing the big league spotlight had an absolute runaway champion in Pittsburgh. Honus Wagner and the boys posted the second best winning percentage in major league history with a record of 103 and 36. League runner-up Brooklyn finished 27 and a half games behind, and remember this is an era with roughly a 140 game schedule, not the 162 of today. Wagner factored in a league best 196 runs when combining runs scored and runs batted in. Jack Chesbro went 28 and 6 in his final NL campaign, while Jesse Tannehill and Deacon Philippe each won 20 games apiece. Now let's run through the major timeline of events for the 1902 season. January 4th, pitcher Bill Deneen jumps from the National League Club in Boston to the city's American League franchise. March 4th, 
AL clubs agree to adopt a three-tier ticket plan that will charge 25 cents for bleacher seats, 50 cents for grandstand seats, and 75 cents for front center grandstand seats. March 12th, outfielder Mike Donlin, runner-up for the AL batting title in 1901, is forced to miss almost the entire 2 season when he is sentenced to six months in prison for assaulting actress Minnie Fields. Donlin would later marry another actress and play bit roles in silent films. April 21st, a Pennsylvania court reverses a lower court decision and issues a permanent injunction barring Lajoie from playing in Pennsylvania unless it's for Philly's NL team. Lajoie skirts the issue along with a pair of Philadelphia AL teammates by going to Cleveland's AL franchise for token compensation. However, none of them are allowed to play on road trips to Philadelphia. I want to note just quickly that some sources I saw said this was the Pennsylvania Supreme Court making this ruling. Others, that it was an appeals court. Couldn't really get consistent information there. So we'll just say a, uh, a high up court in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. April 26th, Addie Joss throws a one-hitter for Cleveland against St. Louis in his Major League debut. May 9th, following a doubleheader loss at Chicago the previous day, New York NL manager Horace Fogel has umpires measure the distance from the pitcher's rubber to home plate. The distance is shorter than regulation, and the park's groundskeeper is made to dig up the plate and move it back 13 inches. New York's protest of the two losses is accepted, and the game's thrown out by league officials. June 2nd, Cleveland makes an American League record six errors in a single inning. June 3rd, St. Louis National League pitcher Mike O'Neill hits the first pinch-hit grand slam in Major League history in the ninth inning of a win at Boston. June 4th, Napoleon Lajoie makes his Cleveland debut, going 1-for-3 in a win over Boston. June 11th, Philadelphia AL manager Connie Mack signs Rube Waddell from the Pacific Coast League. Waddell goes on to win 24 games in 1902. June 15th, in a Class D Texas League game, short outfield fences at a small park rented to skirt local Sunday Blue Laws help Corsicana catcher Jay Clark slug an organized baseball record eight home runs in a 51-3 win over Texarkana. June 22nd, Chicago's Jack Taylor and Pittsburgh's Deacon Philippe go toe-to-toe -to -toe for 19 innings, with Philippe allowing a run-scoring single to Bobby Lowe in the bottom of the 19th to suffer a tough luck loss. June 30th, New York NL left fielder Jim Jones throws out three runners at the plate in a loss to Boston. Also on that day, Cleveland becomes the first team to hit three consecutive home runs. July 8th, Baltimore AL third baseman John McGraw gains his release so he can go manage the New York NL club. He then helps influence the sale of Baltimore to National League owners who begin to strip Baltimore of its best players, forcing the other seven AL franchises to grant the Baltimore team its players to finish the season. The next day, July 9th, McGraw officially signs to manage New York. August 9th, Cincinnati NL franchise sold for $150,000 by John T. Brush to a group of four. August 13th, Pittsburgh NL star Honus Wagner steals second base, third base, and home plate in the same inning. August 18th, Rochester first baseman Hal O'Hagan engineers the first documented unassisted triple play in pro baseball history in an Eastern League game against Jersey City. August 25th, the American League promises to place a franchise in New York for the 1903 season. September 4th, Chicago NL's David Alex Hardy becomes the first pitcher of modern era to throw a shutout in his Major League debut. The Canadian-born pitcher has only a two-year career. September 7th, Brooklyn and New York National League clubs play a home-and-home doubleheader. September 9th, 
John T. Brush buys the New York National League Club for $200,000 from Andrew Friedman. September 10th, Philadelphia AL Southpaw Rube Waddell is the first pitcher to win two games in the same day despite starting neither contest. He picks up wins in relief in 9-4 and 5-4 triumphs over Baltimore. September 11th, Jack Malarkey is the first Major League pitcher to win his own game by hitting an extra innings walk-off home run. His clout off Mike O'Neill in the bottom of the 11th gives Boston a 4-3 win over St. Louis, and it's Malarkey's only career homer. September 13th, Joe Tinker, Johnny Evers, and Frank Chance, one day to be honored in a poem as the greatest double play trio of all time, appear in the same game for the first time for Chicago's NL squad. Two days later, September 15th, they complete their first double play. And September 20th, Nixie Callahan of Chicago's AL team throws a no-hitter against Detroit. Now let's take a look at the final American League standings for the 1902 season. First place in champion Philadelphia, 83 wins, 53 losses. Second place, St. Louis, 78 and 58, five games back. They were last year's last place team while in Milwaukee. They moved to St. Louis and a considerable improvement for them. Third place, Boston, 77 and 60, six and a half games back. Fourth place, Chicago, 74 and 60, eight games off the pace. So the uh, last year's top two teams, Chicago and Boston, dropped to fourth and third, respectively, uh, the year later. Fifth place, Cleveland, benefiting from uh, Lajoie's presence. They improve a bit from last year, 69 and 67, 14 games back. Sixth place, Washington, 61 and 75, 22 games out. Seventh place, Detroit, 52 and 83, 30 and a half games behind. And finally, poor Baltimore. They had a rough go of it in 1902 uh, before they move up to New York, 50 and 88. They do finish the season, however, so that's uh, that was the positive. 34 games out of first place for them. Now the final National League standings, and uh, oof, this was uh, this is pretty ugly to look at. First place champion Pittsburgh, as I mentioned. Second best winning percentage of all time. They just run roughshod over the league. 103 wins, 36 losses, 741 win percentage. Second place, Brooklyn, 27 and a half games back, 75 and 63 record for them. Third place, Boston, 73 and 64, 29 games out. Fourth place, Cincinnati, even 500 at 70 and 70, 33 and a half games behind. Fifth place, Chicago, 68 and 69, 34 games out. Sixth place, St. Louis, 56 and 78. They were hurt by a lot of players jumping to the new St. Louis AL team. They finished 44 and a half games off the pace. Seventh place, Philadelphia, 56 and 81, 46 games out. And finishing a whopping 54 and a half games out of first place. Eighth place, New York, 48 and 90. But help is on the way with John McGraw. That will turn around quickly. Now the league leaders for the 1902 season. We're going to start in the AL. And uh, some controversy over the batting champion. Uh, half my sources said it was Lajoie. Half my sources said it was Ed Delahanty, who was a new player uh, moving to Washington for the 02 season. Lajoie did finish two points higher, 378 to 376. I think what probably happened is Lajoie missed a chunk of time and for some time probably wasn't officially able to contend for the batting title because he didn't have enough at bats. But I guess they uh, went back and said that he did. So we're going to give it to, uh, to Napoleon, 378, second straight batting title for him. Home runs leader Sox Sabold from Philadelphia, 16. This would be the record until a man named Babe Ruth came into the game. RBI champion Buck Freeman of Boston, 121. In terms of runs scored, two guys topped the list, both from Philadelphia, Dave Fultz and Topsy Hartzell at 109 each. Stolen bases, Hartzell, 47 for Philadelphia. 
wins. Cy Young did not win the Triple Crown this time, but he did still lead the league in wins with 32 for Boston. ERA, Ed Seaver of Detroit, 1.91, and I saw that he had a losing record, uh, which is quite impossible having an ERA under two. So uh, that tells us how Detroit season went overall. And the strikeout champion, Rube Waddell, Philadelphia, 210 in his first year for Connie Mack's team. National League leaders, and not as much controversy here, batting champion Ginger Beaumont of Pittsburgh, 357. Home run champion Tommy Leach of Pittsburgh with six, and that was the lowest total for a champion, a, I believe, in the entire 20th century. Honus Wagner, first place in RBI with 91. Runs scored 105 and stolen bases with 42. So Honus continues to make his name as the uh, biggest star in the game at that point. Pitching leaders wins Jack Chesbro of Pittsburgh. The champions 28. He would move on to the American League after this season. ERA Jack Taylor, I mentioned him uh, going 19 innings. Complete game with Deacon Philippe of Pittsburgh. Uh, incredible uh, accomplishment for both those guys. But Taylor... 1.33 ERA for Chicago wins the title there. And in strikeouts, Vic Willis of Boston, 225. He also had 45 complete games. I still can't believe that number. I keep looking at it, and uh, my eyes keep popping out that a guy would complete 45 games. That's quite, quite amazing uh, when you look at it from today's perspective. So those are the league leaders, and I believe we've gone through all the champions. No postseason. Again in 1902, that will change in 1903. A lot will change in 1903. So that's going to be a big podcast uh, next time when we discuss the uh, coming together of the national pastime, the two leagues forming into one entity and becoming what we know today truly with a championship series at the end of the season. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Pastime Timeline Podcast. My name is Michael Wilkinson. Thanks for tuning in, and have a great day. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Darren Hayes, host of the Pigskin Dispatch and Jersey Dispatch podcast. I hope you've enjoyed another great episode here on Sports History Network. Now, speaking of sports history, this episode was brought to you by Firefly Books, and they have two great ones for you this summer. For basketball fans, they have the NBA 75, the definitive history by author Dave Zaram, who's appeared on our Jersey Dispatch podcast recently. He tells about the experience, the thrilling journey of the NBA from its humble beginnings to its modern glory. Uncover the untold stories of triumph, controversy, and the greatest stars of the game. This isn't just a book. It's courtside seats to over 75 years of NBA history. And for the golf enthusiasts, swing into the golf round I'll never forget by Matt Adams. Relive 50 of golf's most memorable moments through the eyes of the legends themselves. From Garcia's triumph at the 2017 Masters to Nicholas' miraculous 1986 comeback, it's the closest you'll get to walking the fairways with golf's greatest. Get your summer read on. Grab a copy of NBA 75 or The Golf Round I'll Never Forget. Available online or at your favorite bookstore.